Do we have any entrepreneurs in the audience? Raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Awesome, Woo! love to see that at events. Uh, anyone doing a software startup or high tech uh, venture of some kind? Uh, I get to pick on you then. What's your name? Steven, one sentence. What does your uh, startup company do, your, uh, your company? Okay, for, oh, I like that, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, here's our situation. Uh, it was, Stephen, how do you spell that? Uh, with an V, okay. Um, so you just went and you guys had a successful exit with one of your uh, competitors, large company in the industry. Um, and because you're an awesome entrepreneur type, you exited with a boatload of money. Uh, how much did you exit with? Oh, come on, be generous. Be more generous. $100 million sounds good. You're a pretty successful guy. <laughs> so this is you as Steve. I'm an artist. I'm just not a very good one. <laughs> and you have your scratched dry erase board, $100 million. Now, because you do stuff in the pharmaceutical space, you decide that you want to uh, dedicate some of this money towards overcoming diseases. There's a lot of things that are plaguing humanity, all manner of different illnesses and diseases, so we want to do something about that. Um, he picked on you earlier, I get to do that now. Uh, is there a disease that you're passionate about, maybe a friend or loved one has it, or something that you're really sensitive to? Depression, okay, that's a good one. Um, so you and Steve get together because this event is great at facilitating connections, and you guys decide to start a depression foundation. And you're going to d support research on depression. Steve, you're a really nice guy. I like you already, even though the lights, I can't see you at all. Um, <laughs> uh, how much money do you wanna give for an endowment for this foundation? 15 million, okay, we're gonna do a $15 million endowment into this foundation. And some of you might discover this is the eventually going to turn into our traditional grant system. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. Okay, so what's gonna happen, you have this foundation and there'll be researchers like me who decide that they want to do research on depression. And so they're going to submit proposals for the foundation to review with the hope that money will be returned to support research. There's a problem with this. Um, do you have a PhD or an MD or what sort of depression stuff do you do? Uh, I'm a social worker. You're a social worker, okay. So maybe looking at very detailed um, biochemistry sorts of projects might be a little challenging. Um, what about you? I get to pick on you also because you're sitting up front. Uh, <laughs> they decide to appoint you to head up this foundation. Um, are you, do you have any experience reviewing grant proposals? No, I don't either. So uh, what do you suppose we should do here to have these uh, ideas thoroughly vetted? Go ahead, I heard something over here. Hire someone. Hire someone, or we don't want to hire people because we're a foundation, so we can get this stuff pro bono. Uh, we're going to do the peer review process. So these proposals are going to be sent out to experts in whatever the field is that the foundation is working with. And because they're super nice, these experts are going to review the proposals, and they're gonna kick them back with a go or no go based on the quality of the research. What I've described here is fundamentally how the peer review system works for biomedical research. Um, this model can be extended to public works. We could get rid of Steve here and just say the government, and then instead of the Depression Foundation, we could say the NIH. Uh, but fundamentally, this is the mechanism. And, and I think it works pretty well. Um, the, the experts do a really good job of ensuring the quality of research is the highest possible, and, and uh, good research gets funding, and if not, the researcher gets good feedback from these folks on how to improve the proposal. So this is how it works. Um, before I dive into a little bit of a tangent and how uh, the, the shortcomings of this model, I wanna talk a little bit about motivations. Steve, you started this foundation. Um, what motivates you? Why did you start this foundation in the first place? You're cheating, that's not fair, Steve. That's not very nice to your speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you start the foundation? Because I love people and I want to see them live quality of life. 
Okay, so you want to improve quality life, and uh, if I may be so bold as to say, maybe cure depression? Absolutely. Cure, can we, can we agree that perhaps up here, our motivating factor is to cure whatever the thing is? Now, Steve's a good entrepreneur. He wants to make sure that it's a cure that you have to keep getting pharmaceutical prescriptions for to support the foundation and his other stuff. That's okay. <laughs> I'm right there with you, Steve. I like it. Um, uh, what's motivating our researcher? You look like you don't want me to talk to you. <laughs> so what's motivating our researcher? Yeah. Uh, could be financial motives. Okay, so he wants to eat, or she yeah. wants to eat. That's a good one. Um, you look like you don't want me to call on you either. <laughs> what do you think motivates our researcher? I think he or she wants her name on the, on the paper. Okay, so we want a little bit of recognition. That's good. Um, I would go a bit broader into something that encompasses both of those things. Uh, and I would say that predominantly researchers are motivated by the project that they're interested in working on. Is that a fair assumption? Um, sometimes the project could be in line with the cure that Steve is going for, or Steve's assistant. Um, but so, so some researchers are very project or goal oriented um, with wanting to do some sort of cure. Other times they're more basic science, just trying to learn a little bit more about the universe. And that's, of course, uh, a, a very important thing also. Uh, what do we suppose the experts are motivated by? Um, I'm going to bother you over here. What do you think? Figuring out what's new and upcoming. And oh, they're the experts. They're not the researchers in this scenario. I'll let you have that. Money? They're not being paid, though. Oh, right. They want to be experts. They want to be experts already. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so experts, I would argue, are motivated by being experts. And I'll take it one step further, um, because that's a little rude to our expert reviewers who give us their free time. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that in peer review, the role of the expert is really to ensure quality of the science, right? So we don't want a proposal coming in from a researcher that's bad and then getting this limited $15 uh, million that we have here. Um, probably should designate that that's $15 million instead of $15. There's a difference. Um, so, so, so the peer-reviewed folks are, are motivated by quality science. Now, when we talk about business and we talk about research, there's a, one particular topic where they're completely divergent, and that's risk tolerance. In the in investment land and business land and these sorts of things, uh, we talk all the time about risk tolerance and risk of different investments and uh, return on investment, all these sorts of things. Um, but in science, we don't really do that very much. So um, I would like to very briefly touch on the risk tolerance levels of these three parties. Um, if Steve's looking for a cure, um, I would argue perhaps that he has a relatively high risk tolerance. Uh, and in fact, with a lot of the investors and, and different philanthropists that I've talked with over time, um, they're actually a little frustrated that when they fund foundations or when they fund different types of groups, uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes the pace of the research is very slow. Research is a slow thing. Um, but they're very comfortable with funding riskier projects that end than, than what end up being funded through this sort of uh, traditional peer-reviewed process. So up, up here, I'm going to say, high risk tolerance. Uh, the researcher will vary. Some researchers are very conservative in their projects. Others are, are very broad. Um, the experts, though, what do you think their risk tolerance is? I need someone over here. I haven't picked on anyone over here. You. Probably pretty low. Probably pretty low. Why do you say that? And you don't get to be an expert if you're wrong. Yes, ab absolutely right. So if you're wrong, uh, if you're wrong and you're an expert, that doesn't bode very well for you. Um, so I, I would argue um, that during the peer review process, we have a tendency to be over conservative. If you're a researcher that kicks something in here that is either high risk or deviates from consensus in the field or something like that, um, you you tend to have issues with the peer reviewed process uh, because um, because it's very conservative by nature and of course you don't get funded. Uh, the other problem that we have here um, in, in a traditional sense is that the average age of getting uh, your first independent grant is something like 42. I'm 27 and I really don't have the patience to wait another 15 years to start doing something meaningful. Um, so as I started studying this model, I started trying to think about how we might be able to get outside of the rat race, if you will, um, and where other opportunities might be. 
And I would argue, uh, and this is something that I'll, I'll say is not mutually exclusive to the peer-reviewed process, but this is something that for certain people in certain circumstances can augment it. And that is to go directly to the source. And, and that's kind of the domain that I like to play in, and this is also the kind of domain that I think a lot of scientists also should consider, a lot of entrepreneurs should consider. Um, loads of people I've talked to, they have great ideas, but you know, we can't really submit this grant proposal to this foundation because, well, we have to tweak it to say what they specifically want to hear. We're not really working on what we wanna do, we're kinda working on what we wanna do because of the funding. And a lot of these people that I talk to have really disruptive ideas, and there's a ton of investors out there that are really sick of the slow pace of things and are completely fine taking on uh, additional risk and funding stuff that's, that's higher risk. There is a huge problem here, of course, if you go directly to, the, uh, directly to the source of the funds, and that is you're absent this critical review of your science. We don't wanna go to an investor uh, who isn't perhaps qualified to review the science without a solid proposal because then we are just wasting money. Um, in my case, what I do is I independently surround myself with a bunch of talking heads, which are my experts, um, so we have scientific advisory board, general counsel, these sort of folks that know a lot more than me about the stuff that we're working on, and these people advise me and make sure that the proposal I have is uh, sufficiently robust to have survived this process, but then we go directly to the investor. A couple interesting things about this model. One, suppose you wanna raise a million dollars for a high impact, very disruptive, but potentially high risk project. A million dollars out of your $15 million foundation uh, uh, endowment is going to be a significant component of the total funds of the foundation. Now, 100 minus 15, I think that's 85, yes. Steve has $85 million left over. Um, if you go to Steve directly for a $1 million uh, raise, then that's something that as a, as a component of the total amount, um, it doesn't sting as much as, the, as it would if you raise at the level of the foundation. Um, Incidentally, uh, this sort of model of, of supporting high-risk research, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, is starting to get rather popular. Uh, it kind of got kick-started with Teal Foundation and uh, their new program, well, it's a couple years old now, Breakout Labs, which explicitly exists to fund uh, high-risk endeavors like this that are very uh, impactful and transformative. Um, Google, of course, has Google X in-house where they do all manner of super secret things that no one knows anything about. Um, and then uh, very recently, Brian Johnson, who had exited with, uh, I think it was Braintree for 800 million, just started a $100 million fund, uh, the OS fund, that was specifically dedicated only to high risk, high reward sorts of projects. Now, these sorts of funds aren't going to emerge unless people think there's real value in supporting higher risk uh, sorts of efforts. Um, so as you guys think about your companies, your projects, and move forward, uh, fundraising is a really important part of the, the we must do. You can have all the intention and ability in the world, but fundamentally you're gonna need funds to be able to do it. And uh, for anyone doing life science research, uh, although this can certainly bleed into other disciplines as well, uh, I think it is very important to think a little outside of the box uh, in terms of these funding strategies. Um, and and of course, I've successfully done this with our group, uh, so I'd be happy to talk to anyone during the networking events afterwards uh, and, and talk about your particular situation and how this sort of model might be applicable to what you're doing. Um, and with that, I think I'm all set. Thank you.